Thank you for joining our session and it's lovely to have you all with us today. I'm Chancel Blakey, a BD manager here at Safecall, and I'm joined by James Lurie from CUME Consulting, and we will be talking through the importance of grievance mechanisms and how this is over often, uh, often overlooked and misunderstood. Safecall is a whistleblowing service provider giving employees and supply chain and other stakeholders the opportunity to report wrongdoing and concerns within their business. Traditionally, we have provided independent reporting lines for employees and over the past few years we have been providing this service into their supply chain. However, we have seen a big increase in the past few months of clients asking more and more about how they can manage this in the supply chain and can we help them with this, especially with the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act and other EU legislations that are coming in or are being introduced in the coming months year. This being one of the reasons we wanted to hold the session today. Before I introduce you to James, I'd like, you, I'd like to talk you through the agenda that James and I will be discussing in more detail. We'll be looking at what the regulatory environment says, dispelling some of those myths of a grievance mechanism and looking at barriers, challenges and some practical guidance for that. And at the end of the session, we'll be looking at a Q&A. So please do ask if you want to ask any questions, do pop them in the questions box at the side and we'll try and cover them at the end of the session. So just wanted to take you through to who are Safecall. So you will spot there if there's any of our clients on the call that there is some new branding here. You are one of the very lucky first few lucky ones to have seen it. It's a sneak preview and we'll be rolling out our brand over the coming months. So do look out for that. So Safecall was established in 1999 and we are an industry leading whistleblowing service provider offering hotlines, training, investigation support and case management software. We cover 5 million plus employees and over a thousand organisations worldwide. We communicate in over 175 languages and dialects across more than 150 countries. And all of our call handlers have at least 25 years investigations experience. And as you can see, we've listed a few of our clients on the slide here, but we do work with a, a many, many clients from across many industries and sectors. So that, that's a little bit about Safecall. So, James, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, would you be able to let the audience know a little bit more about yourself and Kumi Consulting? Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Chantal. It's uh, really nice to be with you today. Uh, so I'm the director with Kumi Consulting and we're a responsible business consultancy that uh, helps companies to improve their social performance and creates value through responsible business practices. Now, uh, showing my age a bit now, the past 25 years of my career, has involved risk management more broadly, but for the last decade, I've been focused on helping companies to understand their labor rights and human rights challenges and sustainability within their supply chains. And that includes nine years living and working in the Middle East on these specific issues as well. So uh, I'm really delighted to uh, have an opportunity to talk with you about this today and looking forward to the, the conversation. That's amazing. Thank you, James. And so, as mentioned earlier, James, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of change in the regulatory landscape for environmental and human rights due diligence in supply chains. Can you talk us through some of the key developments here and how these how this is driving the need for grievance mechanisms? Yeah, of course. Well, look, the regulatory landscape has been evolving really fast and I'm sure many companies who join us today will have attended webinars and briefings on the various human rights due diligence acts and you know, the sustainability laws that have been introduced in recent years. And in each of these is built on the last one. But I think here in Europe, we've seen the most significant developments in supply chain due diligence. And, and you mentioned a few already, Chantel, but I think this is where corporate responsibility for human rights and environment impacts are being embedded in legal frameworks and aligning with global standards set by things like the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and of course the, the OECD guidelines. And so what we've seen is a really strong signal and a shift from so-called soft laws of those things that I just mentioned through to uh, hard law and uh, of course the penalties for non-compliance that go along with it. And, and two good examples of this are the recent introduction of the Norwegian Transparency Act and, and also the act that, that you mentioned, the German Supply Chain Act, the LKSG, uh, which came into effect in January 23. So in common with other regulations, the LKSG, for example, requires large companies to review their global value chains 
uh, to prevent human rights and environment risks, and then of course to, to report on them as well. But the Act also requires companies to establish an effective grievance mechanism to allow people to report violations under the Act. And the Act says that these mechanisms should be accessible to all affected stakeholders. So that's including workers, suppliers, communities, NGOs. And uh, so I think it's really important that come those stakeholder groups, and we'll, we'll definitely cover that, I'm sure, during this morning's discussion. Perhaps though, the most wide ranging of the current requirements can be seen at the uh, EU level with the draft of the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. It's currently in the negotiation phase, so there's still a lot of detail to uh, to work through, but uh, there's no doubt it's a really ambitious directive for member states, which builds on things like the EU Conflicts Minerals Regulation, amongst others. And the other thing to, to say here as well is that although these acts apply to companies who are in scope, that's to say, you know, companies of a particular size, in the LKSG's uh, case, it's 3,000 or more employees, uh, it would be a thousand from January. The the effects of these acts will be much wider, and and that's because the suppliers of those in scope companies will also have a uh, an indirect obligation for um, companies that will flow due diligence responsibilities through the supply chain. So I guess what I'm saying here is that the uh, companies impacted by these laws will be much wider than the companies that are actually in scope. If that makes sense. So. What we're seeing is many companies still uncertain, though, how to respond to uh, to these acts and, of course, the challenges that are then thrown up. Um, what I would say, though, and, and hopefully this will be of some comfort, is that companies aren't expected to be compliant from day one. Nevertheless, there's still quite a big gap in how ready companies are. And I think there's many reasons for this, you know, uh, not least of which is the complexity of supply chains. But I think perhaps one of the most misunderstood areas of all of the acts at the moment is around stakeholder engagement and, of course, the role that a grievance mechanism plays. So let me just quickly highlight this issue for a moment. According to the ILO, around 19% of workers in global supply chains have access to a grievance mechanism. Now, the uh, Fair Labour Association back in 2019 did a similar uh, study and, and found 25%. So actually the numbers declining. So what this means is that the vast majority of workers in global supply chains cannot report unsafe working conditions, discrimination or other labour abuses. Oh, James, that's great. You, I mean, you, your point around the regulatory environment changing rapidly is certainly something we're hearing from companies we talk to. And I think you're, you're right. Many companies may overlook stakeholder engagement. So how do grievance mechanisms fit into this? Mm. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's, in answering that, it's important really to think, first of all, what a grievance mechanism actually is, because there are a lot of misunderstandings on this, and um, I'm sure we'll cover some of those later. Um, but before I get into that, uh, an important point to note, I think, is how we've got to this point with grievance mechanisms. And actually, um, grievance mechanisms date back to, certainly the form we recognise now, date back to the early 90s when many companies and NGOs, particularly in the oil and gas sector, began to develop processes to address social and environmental impacts of their operations. But it really wasn't until the late 2000s and then with the UN uh, guiding principles in 2011 that actually uh, companies more broadly began to adopt grievance mechanism into their practices. And the UN GPs and the DNA of that in terms of uh, their effectiveness criteria for grievance mechanisms can be seen throughout the laws that I mentioned earlier. So in simple terms, a grievance mechanism is just a formal process um, or system that allows individuals or groups like employees, suppliers or communities to raise concerns that a company's practices have impacted their rights. And of course, these mechanisms can be used to resolve disputes. They can investigate allegations of abuse um, and importantly, provide remedies for those who've been impacted. It's important also, I think, Chancel, to note at this point that we're talking here about non-judicial mechanisms. So, of course, there's lots of formal legal processes that um, can be uh, that, that can go through for raising grievances, uh, judicial bodies like tribunals or courts. But within a non-judicial mechanism, such as those that businesses adopt, 
we typically see a number of different reporting channels for raising a grievance. And I think, again, that's an important point to note, particularly where uh, you know, people think of whistleblowing lines as being synonymous with the grievance mechanism. Um, and of course, those channels can also include not just uh, technology like phone lines or websites, but a company's own HR processes. It can also include an independent body that can investigate complaints and provide recommendations on resolution. And perhaps one of the most um, uh, overlooked channels really is in the community based mechanisms that involve committees that represent people's concerns. So that is to say really that a mechanism uh, encompasses all of these different things. But the key thing here is understanding the potential stakeholders that could be impacted by the business and then designing different channels around their needs. And this is where successful mechanisms are, are grounded in that ongoing engagement. So look, finally, I would say that as challenging as some of it might sound uh, in terms of building a mechanism, there are some really sound business reasons to do this just you know beyond compliance and i think it's no surprise really that if you build trust and good relationships with stakeholders then you can identify and resolve issues before they escalate and then of course reduce financial uh, legal and reputational risks yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, a grievance mechanism needs to provide multiple reporting channels. And, and this is how clients typically use our service as channels that form part of a system. We also see a big difference in the ability of, community, of co companies to follow up with remediation for a grievance where the reporter has been able to share their experiences in their own language as part of an actively managed conversation. But we also recognise that it's not appropriate for all reporters. And so I think other channels such as web based reporting reporting or other forms of messaging such as email have their place. For us, I think the important thing is, is, is to be able to provide our clients with actionable information so that they can act on this and resolve the grievance or a wider issue. Through, you can do this through a case management system where an organisation can track you know, the report that when it came in, the steps taken, and then close the report off giving the organisation full visibility of any reports raised. So, so absolutely completely agree. And um, I think uh, James, we, we hear quite a lot of common myths really from our clients and we really, really would love to hear your thoughts on these. And um, yeah, would, would you be happy to, to go through those with me if that's OK? And um, our first one yeah, would be, um, we don't get any grievance reports, so we don't have a problem. What would you say to that? Yeah, look, this is quite a common one, Chantal. I've, I've heard this a lot, you know, that the fact that um, uh, when we're working with organisations or, or, or suppliers, actually, that we hear uh, that, you know, um, we, we don't have anything, we don't have the problems with grievance because nobody's reporting it. And uh, what I would say that obviously no news is not good news, if that makes sense. Uh, in Absolutely. fact, in my experience, you know, low or no engagement can be a really good indicator of actually a system that's not working, you know, or it's been poorly communicated with with stakeholders. Um, I'd also say actually linked to this one. I, I hear a lot from suppliers in Villa. Uh, a company has an open door policy. I'm not sure if you you hear yes. this as well, but <laughs> we <hear that>. <laughs> so uh, we, you know, say uh, anyone can come to management and raise an issue, and we'll deal with it. You know, um, now the challenge with that, of course, is that it's not an effective grievance mechanism if the grievance relates to the management itself. Exactly. So if you're saying you've got an open door policy. Um, and actually, my problem is with you as an employer, that's not a legitimate um, mechanism or a channel rather. So um, another example actually of this is um, I, I visited a factory uh, quite a few years ago now that had a grievance process based on an anonymous complaints box. And so the idea being is that if you had a, a, an issue, um, anybody could post a, a grievance anonymously in this um, sealed box and um, that was that was the mechanism. So obviously I asked the question, how many complaints have you had in the last 12 months? Uh, and they were pretty proud actually. They said none, uh, everybody's happy in their job. And um, so as part of the, the factory tour, I said, you can show me, show me where the box is. And um, they took me to the manager's office and just outside the door of the manager's office on a little table was, was the box. Over the top of the box, was a camera and then in big letters on the box was written complaints. So 
I you don't need to be a grievance expert to see the issues there. I'm sure with uh, absolutely with that, and um, but it's still still a mystery to them why nobody was using it. So, like I think effective mechanisms are those that are trusted by users and rights holders. So they consider you know uh, barriers like access, like language, technology, literacy. Um, but but most importantly, I think the agency of those using them. So if you uh, feel that you can't raise a complaint or you're concerned uh, about the repercussions, if you do so, then that's not an effective mechanism. No, no, I completely agree. And we, we get this all the time where people say, oh, we don't have any any concerns or comments. And, and it's you are completely right. It's how how does that person protect that anonymity? How are you communicating with them? But also what what mechanisms are you putting in place for them to be able to to make that in a safe environment? So I, I, I completely agree on that one. So the next one is um, our corporate whistleblowing hotline is our grievance mechanism. What would you say to that, James? Yeah, look, um, Again, we, we do hear this a lot, and I think I alluded alluded to to this earlier. Um, and actually, I had a, a case of this where I was was told, you know, this is our number um, for, for the line, and we, we use it for human rights and labour rights and other things. Um, and and the the case in point was a a real estate client where I was developing a human rights management system, and and it was relatively early into the project, and I was reviewing what was in place. And um, in the meeting room that I was in, I looked up at the wall and I noticed a, uh, a mobile phone number on it. And um, at the top of the number, it said uh, speak up line. And I, I asked what it was and uh, was told it's for reporting bribery and human rights violations. So I, I was really intrigued in that. I asked where the line went and um, the, the client that I was meeting wasn't sure. Um, so we called it. We uh, on the conference call phone in the middle of the table, we we gave the number a ring. Now, the, the voice on the other net end said hello and uh, seemed very surprised to get the call. And it, it turned out actually that the voice belonged to the company's global head of compliance, who was as surprised as we were to uh, to uh, hear his, his voice. Now, the company policy for anti-bribery required a whistleblowing line, so the company used this number and then repurposed it for the human rights policy. So again, obviously not an effective process, but it's understandable that people think of their whistleblowing line um, as, a, as a broader grievance mechanism um, because of the anti-bribery and corruption um, uh, and, and frankly other ethics lines that they might already have in place. So many companies use the term grievance and whistleblowing interchangeably. Um, so, I think I think this is part of the challenge really is understanding uh, what a grievance mechanism actually is versus the, the channels that sit within it. Um, uh, so, of course, whistleblowing and grievance isn't the same thing. But again, an existing whistleblowing line can be part of a grievance mechanism, but it's not the mechanism. And even then, it's probably only set up, as I say, to deal with direct white collar employees and, and countries of operation that um, uh, that those direct employees sit in and, and therefore it doesn't necessarily translate to the supply chain. So look, as we mentioned earlier, the overall mechanism really does need to be capable of handling the, the complexity of different stakeholder needs and uh, obviously it should allow for multiple channels of engagement, not just a line or a, a website or so on. And, and it should also support the ongoing engagement, of course, between the company and its stakeholders and then provide for those suitable remedies as well. No, no, and I, and I think we we see actually uh, interestingly on our across our line actually uh, around probably around seventy percent, depending on industry and sector that you're coming from, are actually more HR grievances, um, and and that's that's what we see, and then the other areas around dishonest behaviours, general, which is more around your policy procedures, but it is quite interesting what you're saying there because actually it's about having a function and being able to communicate that correctly so that people know what they're calling that line for so yeah no that's really really interesting thank you james and um, the next one is um one size fits all it's best to take the same approach everywhere what would you say to that yeah i mean at this point it's probably obvious what uh, <laughs> what i'm going to say but look the again I, I completely understand the the desire from the policy perspective 
of, of taking the same approach, you know, um, because we've seen it with ethics lines. Yeah, ethics lines will be a single number typically hosted by a third party. Um, and this number is then communicated on a website or in a code of conduct. And, you know, wh when thinking about human rights due diligence, uh, a lot of companies will be going back to what they did before with other forms of compliance. And in fact, it's actually the same teams generally who are responsible um, for the human rights due diligence that are also responsible for uh, ethics and uh, other integrity based issues. So it's natural that they would look to to what they've done before. Um, but as I said, hopefully by this point, it goes without saying that that's not an effective approach and it doesn't account for the range of stakeholders needs and preferences when it comes to reporting grievances. Oh, no, that's perfect. Thank you. And just one more final one, James, is technology can manage everything for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm conscious with this, Chancel, that uh, I'm talking, uh, you know, with, with a company that provides a technology solution. But uh, look, um, absolutely, technology has its place. And um, this is an interesting one because when used effectively, you know, technology like apps, uh, WhatsApp, call lines, case management software, all of this can really help stakeholders to raise issues effectively. But like any other technology um, where it's not implemented properly or, or thought through, then that's that's really where the, the issues come from. Um, you know, tech though can help businesses track grievance cases and remain in contact with stakeholders while the grievance is being remediated. So I think that while technology can play this important role, um, it, it can't be an effective mechanism on its own. So it needs a human, essentially, and um, therefore assessing the severity of a grievance or the you know, suitability of a remedy uh, needs that human judgment. It needs empathy and the ethical considerations that go along with that. Um, the other thing I would say is, that, you know, not all stakeholders will, of course, have access to tech platforms as well, you know, to to raise those grievances. So, again, it's thinking about how do you design effective channels to uh, cater to all stakeholder needs within a supply chain? And, and this is particularly true when you think about remote locations in, in areas of supply chains as well. You know, how do we how do we engage um, often vulnerable workers in those situations? How do they report issues with their employment practices? And we've seen, of course, too many times where a call line or a web tool is used as the only channel. and. You know, we, we had some examples just now of that. Um, and I think, you know, when I, I hear about those previous questions with regards to the companies who are saying we've got the open door policy or we have a whistleblowing line um, and they're receiving no calls. The, the big problem there, of course, is that this can give a false sense of assurance, you know, a, 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 and a feeling that there is no problem. And then um, what that leads to is, uh, of course, a, a controversy blowing up where a uh, a rights holder or a stakeholder hasn't been able to raise the grievance properly. So it's then escalated into either direct action or uh, in some cases litigation on behalf of the group of stakeholders. So uh, tech's great, but you need to do human as well, Chantelle. Yeah, and, and again, I think that's completely right, because obviously you can get given the tools to help you do that. But obviously it's you that has to comply with that. You know, you need to make those decisions or how what processes and procedures you're putting in place to manage that process. So once that report comes through to you, what are you doing and what steps are you doing? And you're completely right. The human touch is definitely, definitely very, very important. So, so thank you so much for that. But uh, before we move on, um, please do remember to keep your questions coming in through the Q&A chat box. That'd be perfect. So please do drop them in and then we'll get to those as soon as we can. So, James, we've talked around myths and challenges and what the requirements are, and it would be really great to get some practical advice on what companies should be doing. Yeah, of course, of course. And um, th there's a lot to cover here. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> it's it's not a not a straightforward approach, but let, let me let me pick off some of the, the key things. And, and I think the first thing to mention um, and a really good starting point for most um, organisations here is to uh, is to go back to the UN guiding principles and have a look at the effectiveness criteria for grievance mechanisms uh, in there. And, and actually, if you have a, a grievance channel in place already, uh, again, thinking about it through the lens of the UN guiding principles 
uh, will give you a good head start in terms of identifying some of the challenges that people might have in accessing that grievance mechanism. Um, but look, the, a, a nice example that I think brings a lot of this together, um, you know, we can look back at lots of different case studies here, but, but one in particular that stuck with me was in 2021 actually, when a group of, um, or a representative group of children who'd been working cobalt mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, they filed a lawsuit against a US automotive company and uh, they alleged that they'd been subjected to forced labour and other human rights abuses as part of their of their work. And the the company concerned did have a grievance mechanism in place for workers in its supply chain. But again, it was limited by the reporting channels that it was used and, and the technology. And um, this this company um, it was a market or is a market leader in its space and, and it is actually focused on technology so you can kind of see the company DNA coming through uh, in its uh, in its mechanism but essentially the mechanism was not in line with the UN guiding principles and so it wasn't accessible to all workers um, because you know it only allowed abuses to be reported through the company's website. Um, it also wasn't legitimate because it relied on the company to investigate and then resolve those issues. So, so no independence at all there. And then also there were no clear or there was no clear information on resolution or, or the timeframes for resolution. So if I raise a grievance, I have no idea when something's going to happen or, or what happens next. Um, including how I can challenge a decision made or uh, get information on the outcomes of, of grievance uh, resolution. So, you know, when you're thinking about where the companies start, I think the good news is that, you know, most companies have many of the tools and processes yeah. that they already need in the business, you know, but it's just a case of, uh, of adapting these and then taking uh, a systems approach to designing their mechanism. So, so let me maybe outline four or five things here which um, which might help. Um, firstly, the most important step is, as we've said all along, is to consider the stakeholder needs and preferences. So there's many things we've already discussed on this, um, you know, including uh, considering cultural aspects here, but it really does mean mapping and engaging stakeholder groups within the business. So again, the good news is if you are already undertaking supply chain due diligence, you'll probably be some way towards doing this. But, but that engagement part is really important. And this is how you understand your stakeholder needs and, and requirements. So uh, make sure that you are identifying all of your stakeholders that could be impacted by your, your business and then designing channels that, that are appropriate for them. The other thing that I think I hear quite a lot from companies is that um, you know, they, they have concerns about, do I have to apply grievance channels to everybody in the supply chain at all, at all tiers, you know? And, and of course, as part of overall due diligence, you'll, you'll want to identify where impacts will happen. Um, and you may also extend some channels of your mechanism to indirect suppliers who are at heightened risk, for example, um, but I would say that it's important also to make sure that your suppliers have their own mechanisms yeah, okay. and that those mechanisms are based on the same things that we've been talking about today um, and, and follow those principles. Um, so I, I suppose in summary on that point, you know, uh, yes, extend your mechanism, but but it's not the only uh, only thing that um, vulnerable workers and communities should be uh, interacting with. Certainly go to encouraging going to their employers first where that's appropriate to do so um, to raise issues because a lot of those things can be dealt with with locally. Um, the next thing is to to consider uh, again the possible lack of agency of stakeholders using a mechanism. So this is to say that where people whose rights have been impacted and, and particularly Sean, so I'm thinking about um, you know abusive working conditions yeah, of course. those those things might be exacerbated further if your mechanism doesn't address, you know, anonymity and, and the fear, the genuine fear of reprisal from, from an employer. So it's really important that the process can protect stakeholders um, and also includes the option to use independent partners um, when there's serious grievance cases that, that are 
uh, impacting uh, you know those rights holders even further. The other thing I would think about as well is the resources that you'll need. So providing a grievance mechanism in a large international business can be can be particularly challenging. Um, but something that many people not might not have considered in their approach is how to use partnerships and capacity building with with your suppliers um, and, and also NGOs, you know, industry collectives and others. And um, a really nice example actually of this for me is is with Nestle, where um, you know, Nestle, the world's largest food and beverage company, they partnered with the International Labour Organization, the ILO, to provide a grievance handling process for, for its cocoa farmers. Um, now, the ILO uh, helps the farmers to understand their rights and provides them with a way to report violations. Um, and, and most of these complaints and issues are resolved through mediation. So it's, it's a nice, nice example of how that dialogue and ongoing understanding works. And then, of course, in a few cases, the, the ILO has taken legal action against companies that have been found to be in violation of, of labour laws. So that's a nice example, I think, of where you can uh, use a partnership approach to address these issues as, as part of your overall grievance mechanism, where, where it makes sense to do so. And then linked to this is, of course, the important step of remediation itself. And again, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around this because when we typically think of re remediation, we think about fixing something or um, you know, paying money. And, and it's, not, it's not about that. It's mainly concerned with the restoration of rights that have been impacted. And, and of course, in many cases, that can actually involve you know, an acknowledgement or an apology by a company. Um, although in, in these litigious, uh, litigious uh, times, it's quite uh, difficult for yeah. companies to, to do that. But, you know, letting people know that your uh, company has a plan to address the the activity or the thing that caused the issue it is really important for, for rights holders and stakeholders as well. So making sure that that remediation process, is, process uh, understands the root causes and then acts on those and is legitimate and predictable for rights holders is, is, is a key point. So um, finally, on, on that last point, actually, uh, I really can't stress enough the importance of telling people how to engage with the grievance process, but then also communicating the outcome of any remediation that you do. And, and I think it's this transparency, really, Chancel, that is the, the single biggest trust builder that a, that a company can do. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think for me, some key questions to consider when setting up specific reporting channels as part of an overall grievance mechanism are which stakeholders are setting up, are you setting up your reporting channel for? So have you mapped the key stakeholders in your supply chain? Who in your business should be involved with, you know, who, who should you be considering setting this up with? Should it be HR, compliance and risk, general counsel, supply chain, health and safety? I think sometimes we forget that we should be looking at this from an overall overarching picture and a holistic view really more than anything. So it's about making sure those correct stakeholders are in there, but also the other stakeholders that would be involved, you know, including the communities and other areas as well. Thinking about general compliance considerations as well, you know, have you reviewed your grievance policy? Have you reviewed the other policies? What do they say? Is that, you know, is it a little bit out of date? Was it done a few years back? Should you be considering looking at doing that now? Um, and have you aligned this with your human rights policy and code of conduct? So, you know, there's lots of things changing, especially around con code of conduct, responsible sourcing. What should that look like? Are you reviewing this to make sure that, you know, we are, you are keeping up to date with what is happening, uh, you know, with current legislation and up and coming legislation. And the other thing for me is what to consider when setting up your reporting channels and, and how will this be managed? And, you know, how easily can a reporter make a report? That, that's quite important to me. What, how easy is that done? And like you say, through those multiple reporting channels. And can you guarantee their anonymity? Again, just going back on what you said earlier, you know, the person with the, the box on the desk and you've got the camera, that's not really guaranteeing that anonymity of that person. So it's making sure how do you do that? You know, can the reporter speak in their native language, you know, via oral or written communications? What does that look like? It's OK having something in place, 
but how are they able to speak to you or communicate with you if, it, if it's just in one language? Because we find that people need to communicate in their own language because then they're able to deliver that easier than speaking the language of that the preferred company. You know, how are stakeholders trained in, in using the channels you provide as well? That's another thing to be considering as well. And how are those channels communicated? And I think huge, huge, and again, going back on what you said, James, communication is really key because I think, you know, people need to understand there is something there. And there's a lot of people who don't know that. And it's about making sure that communication is working and engaging with your supply chain, you know, your employees or whoever that happens to be within this, within this and making sure that they are fully aware of there are areas that, you know, there's somewhere for them to go and call. Um, how, how will you process any reports from your channels? You know, when, when, when did they come into the business? And and does the uh, do you have a process for investigating a grievance? You know, what does, does that need to be updated? You know, what are those investigations for conducting that investigation for a grievance? And for really serious issues, is there an independent process for investigations using third parties? Again, this is really, really important, you know, making sure it's impartial and independent and someone else is going out there to review that with you. And how are issues escalated to senior managers and how are the outcomes of grievance, grievance remediations communicated to, um, to stakeholders and lessons learned within the wider business? So that, I know that was probably a lot of information there, but for me, it's really, really important that we sit down, you sit down and you you look at these areas and make sure that as an organization you are taking all these things into consideration so as i say these are some of the key considerations that organizations should be looking at to ensure they have a robust grievance mechanism in place so that with this in mind uh, let's move on to our q a discussion so do keep sending in your questions and if we don't have any uh, ch chance to answer all those questions then we will follow up with the frequently asked questions after the session and send that out to you so james just just looking at some of the questions um we've got one here uh, you you mentioned technology not being the answer uh, but what about things like worker voice apps what would you say yeah yeah good question um well, look, I, I'm, I'm actually, despite what I said about technology earlier on and, and the human element, I, I'm a really big fan of these sorts of channels and, um, you know, worker apps in particular, because I've seen firsthand um, how they can be really effective. And, and they do offer, you know, a slightly different approach to, to other channels as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain, uh, I guess, a bit more what I mean by that. But um, I think where workers can access these apps and where they're well implemented they, they do work really well and um and actually you know the, the amount of workers now that have access to a smartphone is is pretty high across supply chains um and even you know further upstream so i think it can be a good way to engage um and the nice thing with an app as well is that it can work in two ways so it can push information as well as pull information uh, on on grievance issues and the the first point there around the push information, that's uh, something that that can be super effective in you know explaining things like health and safety policies and, and advice or uh, you know giving information about labor rights, whatever it might be, and also being able to target that information as well. So uh, you know although you have one app, if you've got uh, factory A, factory B in different regions, you can push different information relevant to perhaps the languages or the labour laws or, or whatever it might be to those regions. So I, I see a lot of potential in this technology. But again, you know, as I said earlier on, um, it is a technology. It doesn't fix things on its own. So it's it's all about uh, how you implement that as, as a company and um, it, and also build trust with people that will use the, the, the app as well, because you know, if your your employer is telling you to download something, you know, you, you might be a bit sceptical about um, having that on your smartphone. So again, I think engaging third parties who can provide that reassurance, um, you know, to, to, to workers that this isn't to track you or to do anything else that uh, that is of concern, but actually it, it can help you to understand, uh, you know, firstly your rights, but then also give you uh, a channel to report issues that you've got. Um, I've also seen it, you know, used really interestingly through worker surveys as well. So pushing out um, flash surveys on a on a particular issue, or um, you know, periodic surveys to support perhaps ongoing due diligence or 
or other needs as well. So, so that's really interesting for me, seeing seeing how these these apps work there. Um, so, yeah, big fan, but implement it right. Yeah, and I think it's about having multiple channels, isn't it? It's about giving that person the you know multiple ways of being able to make a report, and I think that ultimately is the most the the, the best thing, the best outcome for that person to have varying different ways to be able to do that. That's amazing. Thanks, James. So I um, have another question here. So um, how does a grievance mechanism fit into a third party due diligence process? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, I, I think I touched a little bit on this earlier, and um, so, so I guess my answer will build a bit on what I was saying before. But um, and, and that's to say that you know we we talked about how a mechanism can address root causes of risks and and prevent escalation. Um, but I think it's it's probably also useful to think um, or, or to view the mechanism as a source for the risk assessment and identification phase of the due diligence program. So um, I've seen actually you know, firsthand how uh, these, these uh, mechanisms can give really useful information on trends and issues you know, on potential risks and areas for improvement within supply chains. So I think you know, it fits in in many ways as, as both a source of risk identification and as a risk control. Perfect, James. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, another one here. Um, can you give an example of where remediation hasn't worked or has had a negative impact on a business? Yeah, of course, of course. So um, uh, I think actually we, we see, you know, negative impacts um, you know, anywhere a company's first reaction is to deny the substance uh apologies my was <laughs> going in the background um i think uh, where we see uh you know the company's first reaction is to deny the substance of the issue or, or not to address its underlying root causes um but it can also link to what i mentioned earlier about seeing remediation only in financial terms so how much money you know will it take to fix um and again, you'll, you'll see a theme here, which is that successful remediation has to include engagement with people. You know, it has to understand the nature of the grievance and how it's been impacted by them uh, before it can be addressed. So um, I, I think in terms of examples, wherever companies haven't done this properly and, and you know, there's a lack of trust or transparency, we've seen negative impacts. Uh, also, you know, where, where that remediation has been seen as that quick fix and it hasn't addressed the root cause of the grievance and then that erodes trust. So I think, you know, just updating a code of conduct, for example, or increasing audits doesn't really do much to address those root causes. No, that, that that's amazing. Thank you, James. I'm just going to see if there's any more coming through. I mean, we have one here. It says our only mechanism is for employees to contact HR or line manager via call or email. We are a fully remote business with no option to be anonymous. Is this OK? I I think from my, my side, I think that all people should be given an option, whether that is to be named or anonymous. I think for for being anonymous, it's good to give that anonymity level so that that person can put raise that issue without fear of retaliation. So I think, you know, being able to do that. But I think the most important thing is when an anonymous report comes through is be the ability to be able to communicate with that person after they've raised that um, anonymous report. And this is where, you know, technology can come into to great use is that actually being able to communicate with that person through messaging or documents, through a functionality, through a, a back end portal, for example, can really help your organisation in terms of being able to manage and investigate that. And there should be no reason why you couldn't conduct a thorough investigation. But I think people don't feel fully comfortable sometimes with internal processes. You've got to have your internal process, absolutely. But there is a percentage that feel more um, don't feel as comfortable because it could be about their line manager. It could be about the HR team. It could be about the senior exec team. So where do they go? And it's it's giving that person or employee or, or, or supply chain, whoever that happens to be, and multiple channels to be able to make a concern of wrongdoing or, or whatever that happens to look like from within that channel. I don't know. Do you agree, James? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, um, you know, in terms of 
uh, the what we said earlier, actually, in the, the the example around having it completely independent from from line management, it is important to give people that that channel. Um, and you know, third so parties can definitely help with that anonymity. Um, and and I think there's other ways to build build trust with grievance channels as well. So it, it really does depend on the nature of the grievance, but also um, the stakeholder that's that's reporting it. Absolutely. No, no, that's amazing. So um, has anyone else got any questions that they would like to submit through for James and I to answer? I can see a few more actually, Shamsa. Oh, can so you? I might, I can, I can. There's, there's a few popping up. So um, let me, let me pick a few of these. So um, well, there's, there's one here actually that says, can you give, and, and forgive me, the um, person that asked this question might might give a bit more detail, but um, can you give some strong examples of the outcomes, financial if possible, of the grievance mechanism? So to convince uh, management to invest in it, which which sounds like uh, the person asking this question is looking for, for a case study. Um, and the perception is sometimes that a grievance mechanism is a huge investment in time, resources and money uh, and may raise issues that will create a lot of financial losses to the company. Um, especially if some stakeholders are not honest. Uh, great question. There's a lot, a lot to unpack I think, yeah. in that question. So let, let me do my best uh, on it. And I think in terms of making the business case, um, we, we gave some examples earlier of, of how you know you might do this. And um, I think you know it's not just a compliance uh, conversation. You know we we need a grievance mechanism which I, I feel that many companies do still view it in those terms as, you know, uh, the example I gave earlier about how uh, a company has the same number that it's got for its fraud line or its bribery and corruption line. So it's to tick a box essentially. Um, but what we're seeing with the due diligence laws is that's not good enough. And as I mentioned earlier, the uh, uh, many of these laws draw from the UN guiding principles. And so if you, you're, mechanism doesn't meet those uh, criteria that are set out in the due diligence requirements, then I think you're going to struggle to comply in future. Um, in terms of you know business case itself, I think for me, I've seen some really good tangible examples of how having a, a, a legitimate grievance process has actually avoided risk uh, and and um, you know cost in the future. So um, a nice example actually kept, comes from the Middle East of that uh, type of situation where we uh, were uh, looking at a, a project that was being uh, being built, and the workforce had access to a, a grievance reporting channel. Um, in this case, it was a was a hotline, and they were able to raise concerns with their working conditions, but also their living conditions. And um, many of these were, uh, you know, issues that that on their own may not have constituted a, a significant grievance, but but in uh, in a collection where you had lots of these reports at the same time, where there was a trend, you know, we could see it was building towards something. And at the time, you're know, going back uh, four or five years, there was a lot of uh, direct action. Of, of workers going on strike or withdrawing their labour uh, on on work sites, and you know that costs uh, can cost on big construction sites, you know, over a million dollars in lost um, uh, lost time per day, you know, on some of the giga projects. So, I think um, being able to address those issues early uh, to avoid that action being taken, and then understand the root causes and fix those, you know, that that line very quickly paid for itself. And uh, you scale that up across the supply chain and thinking about all of the different risks and challenges that that um, you know could be faced. And, and it does then start to to build a case for you. So um, I, I feel there's a lot in that question. So I will definitely follow up, uh, as, as you say, Chancel, in, in the FAQs on that. And that's lovely. I've just seen one more, actually. Um, I'm not sure if you'd be able to help or we'll follow up afterwards, but a lot of our PAPs don't have access to any electronics. What is a practical solution for comms in these rural African areas? Yeah, and I, I think this is a, a nice question or example of where those community based 
grievance mechanisms come in um, and and also go hand in hand with that continual stakeholder engagement that we talked about earlier on as well you know where you are um, providing uh, forums uh, you know uh, community grievance channels for for people that don't include technology unfortunately in those cases that is that that is as simple as being in the community yeah. talking to stakeholders and rights holders and making sure that concerns are represented that can actually be through a regular forum it doesn't need to be as, as a grievance is is raised and and in those forums and i'm thinking particularly around um the, the mining and metals clients that we work with that that can be really effective in highlighting uh you know uh, localized grievances that actually sat at the desktop um you know in, in another country you just wouldn't think of um, but they can become flashpoints and can be um, can be real issues. So I think um, where technology isn't available, absolutely there are other means of doing it. And, and I would argue more effective means as well, because it means that you're getting in front of yeah. rights holders and, and really deeply understanding those issues. And being kind of the face of the organisation really, isn't it? And, and kind of making people feel safe that they can approach you. So I suppose that's really nice. So no, no, that's amazing. So um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for the questions today. Um, we're kind of coming to the end and I'd like just to finish off with a, a summary really of what we discussed today. But what we will do is we will come back to any other questions and, and make sure that we answer those uh, with you at, at the end. So. Um, just to really finalise this there, just to finish the session and, and to summarise a few key points taken from today. So the first one would be, you know, the move from soft to hard law on supply chain due diligence is well underway. All of the current and forthcoming, current, um, forthcoming due diligence regulations um, require engagement with stakeholders in addressing environmental and social impacts. So that, that's the first point that I think I feel that we should be all taking away. And what this means is, is that you should be looking to adapt your current approaches to understand your impacts on your suppliers, employees, communities and other stakeholders in your business. So what should you be looking to identify and what does that look like for you as an organisation? And I think finally, it also means developing a grievance mechanism that has effective channels to allow for those concerns um, of those stakeholders to be heard and issues remediated effectively. So for us, those are the three key, you know, key takeaways would be, you know, this is the up and coming laws or is in law. This is what you should be looking and doing and how are you actually actioning that and what things are you putting in place to make sure you're you're working towards that. Uh, James, is there anything you wanted to add to that at all before I close? No, I think I think that summarizes things. Um, and, and again, I would just go back to what we said earlier on which is that um you know most companies whether you're directly caught by these acts or you are within the supply chain of, of those companies that are uh, caught within the crosshairs of the act um you you will have to do this and so um, making sure that not only do you have a grievance mechanism but it but it is meeting the needs of stakeholders i think is is um you know the starting point but but also and I'm really grateful for that question around building the business case because not just for grievance mechanisms, but we see this more broadly in responsible sourcing. I think um, being able to make the case to to the wider business for why responsible business is a uh, well, not just a, a force for good, but actually makes sense from a resilience perspective for a company, I think is, is a really important conversation and one that um, you know, I'm always always keen to support. So, so thanks for those questions. And um, as as Chantel says, um, we'll we'll run through them uh, in slower time and, and come back to those that have asked them. That's perfect. So, if you do any, excuse me, if you need any further information, then do reach out to myself and James, and we will follow up, like we say, at the end of the session with a with a with a one pager that's going to talk through what we've spoken about today. And and you can also visit our websites, but we'll get all that to you. So so don't worry about that. But I'd like to thank you all so much for your time today. Um, I'll now close the session um, and we will be in touch again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks, Chancellor. Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye.